Thank you, Eleanor. Uh, it's my great pleasure to be able to introduce our speaker tonight. My name is Tom Thornton, and I'm the Dean of Arts and Sciences here at UAS and also the Vice Provost for Research and Sponsored Programs. And uh, we're very proud tonight to be featuring one of our own, Dr. Carolyn Bergstrom, who is a member of our Natural Sciences Department in Biology. And Carolyn is, is uh, reporting back in some ways on s her recent sabbatical, where she had the opportunity to be in Southeast Alaska, Southeast Alaska, Southeast Asia, and Southeast Alaska, uh, and especially Taiwan, a place where uh, I lived for a whole year, about 30 years ago, but uh, mostly in Taipei. Um, but one of my introductions in Taiwan to um, biodiversity was in going to the fish market uh, outdoors, uh, where they had these Saturday market type things. And one of the things I learned in Taiwan is that people eat everything that comes out of the sea. In fact, they even eat things that come out of the sea in Alaska that we don't eat uh, very much, like sea cucumbers. So uh, I don't know if she'll be touching much uh, on that tonight, but, uh, but there's obviously a lot of biodiversity in Southeast Asia. And we often hear about biodiversity in the context of conservation. And uh, uh, having just lived in, in the UK for 10 years, I, I happened to live next to a biologist who was kind of a critic of this uh, perspective on biodiversity, that we always think of it in terms of conservation. Because we have to think about what we're conserving, what, what parts of biodiversity, because it's millions, uh, millions of species, and of course, for whom. And uh, in England, anyway, there's a kind of dominant ideology that pastoral landscapes populated by sheep are, uh, are the nice kind of biodiversity. But uh, I don't know if any of you have read the book Feral by George Montbio, but George Montbio calls such places sheep-wrecked and barren uh, because they, in fact, don't have much biodiversity. So um, we tend to think about biodiversity in very, very limited ways. And I know Carolyn is going to explore this more deeply by thinking about not just species, but also genetics and habitat and form and function and how those work together to produce the biodiversity that we see in this world. So please help me welcome Dr. Carolyn Bergstrom. Good evening. Thank you, Dean Thornton. And thank you all for coming tonight on a rainy Friday evening. Um, so it's, it's a pleasure and an honor to be able to talk to you tonight about some of the research I've been involved in for many years, but that brought me to the other side of the Pacific uh, during my sabbatical, my research sabbatical leave um, this past year. So I'm a professor here at UAS, I've been here for 10 years, and I love living in Juneau and working in Southeast Alaska as, as a biologist. It's a really great place to live as a biologist. I'm an ecologist by training, an evolutionary ecologist, and I'm interested in natural selections and how it operates in, on species in the wild. But ultimately, I'm interested in biodiversity. And I always have been. So this is me at about seven years old, um, collecting mole crabs on the beach in San Diego, where we lived for some time. And I've always been fascinated with biodiversity. What makes animals tick? Why they're different from each other? How they perceive the world? So I grew up and went to college, got a bachelor's degree in biology, and then decided to pursue a PhD studying the processes that generate and maintain biodiversity in the natural world. But as Tom Thornton brought up a moment ago, what exactly is biodiversity? And it's a complex concept, actually. Some people, well, many people think that they have a pretty, well, pretty good understanding of what biodiversity means, but it's actually, there's many layers to biodiversity, and it means, uh, means different things at different scales. And so, when most people think about biodiversity, they think of a, a coral reef, such as this teeming with species of fish and corals and invertebrate animals, or they think of a, a meadow full of flowers and insects, or 
a tropical rainforest full of vines and snakes and insects and birds and things. And this is all true, this is one layer of biodiversity, but it also operates at a smaller scale. And the smaller scale is what I've always been interested in since I was a child. And so you may have heard, I'll just show you a few examples here um, of finer scale biodiversity. You may have heard of the, the great cichlid species swarm that uh, resides in the Great Rift Lakes of Central Africa. There's hundreds of these species of freshwater cichlids that all live in a fairly small area and have uh, evolved in a fairly short period of time, all fairly closely related to each other. You've probably heard of the Galapagos finches or Darwin's fi finches that reside on the islands of the Galapagos off the coast of Ecuador. There's 15 species in total all close relatives, all evolved from a single ancestor that colonized the islands and diversified in a number of ways, especially in the shape and size of their beak. And this was uh, an adaptation to foraging on different types of seeds or cactuses or insects that were more dominant in some islands than, than the other. So this is a, a, a more narrow layer of biodiversity among these closely related species. And even within single species, you see remarkable differences at times. So you may have heard of three-spined sticklebacks. We, we have them here in the ocean and in our lakes and streams. And they're uh, very common throughout the entire northern hemisphere. And there are literally thousands of populations of stickleback isolated in lakes and ponds, and they each have shifted their morphology and their behavior to specifically be adapted to the particular conditions at each lake and pond. So it's a remarkable diversity of form and function and behavior within a single species, or what we still consider a single species. So then there are the flatfishes. And um, this is a fairly large order of fishes. There's um, a, more than 800 species found in all the oceans of the planet. And they exhibit also a lot of diversity among these species and even within a few, which I'll talk about, will be the focus of my talk tonight. So flatfishes are remarkable in a number of ways, but most notably in that they are completely asymmetrical. They have both eyes on one side of their head and they lie on the ocean floor on the other side, referred to as the blind side. The blind side is also not pigmented, usually, and the, the eyed side that faces up has pigmentation on it. Um, and they come in a huge range of sizes and shapes. So this fish in the lower left here is uh, our, our Pacific halibut, which is one of the largest on the planet. Um, the next one over in the top middle is an arrow-toothed flounder, also a, um, a species common in Alaskan waters. But the other three in the bottom right are from tropical waters. And this includes the, let's see if I can get the mouse to work, this includes the cockatoo flounder here, which has these long filaments, which are parts of its dorsal fin that it uses to touch the sediment and feel around for invertebrates that might be buried there. Um, this is the peacock flounder that has these bright blue spots that are sort of iridescent, much like a peacock's tail. Um, its eyes are very widely spaced apart. I don't know if you can see that very well. Very weird looking fish. This is the four spot sole, which has these four eye spots, they're called, on its uh, uh, tail end of its body. And this is a way to distract predators to try to strike at that tail end and away from the more uh, crucial organs in its head, so hopefully if it gets attacked, it won't be fatal. So lots of variation, lots of different sizes and, um, and shapes. So why are flatfishes worthwhile to study? Well, there's a, a number of reasons. Um, first of all, they're, they're economically very important, the group of fishes, both locally in Alaska and globally. In Alaska, about 14% of our landings by volume are, uh, are flatfishes, and globally this is about 2% of the total global take is, uh, consists, consists of, uh, of flatfishes. 
Um, but secondly, they're just really bizarre and really super interesting. And they have a lot of really fascinating biological features that make them an interesting species to study for someone that has interests uh, such as mine. So I, th I think that, that Picasso um, secretly admired the flatfish since many of his portraits of Dormar, for example, very closely resembles them. And, uh, and this cartoonist here on the lower right imagined that if Picasso ever painted or sketched a flatfish, he would paint it symmetrical in his cubist style, flip it the other way. Um, but so flatfishes are acutely asymmetrical, very bizarre with this whole body asymmetry. But there are many animals in the animal kingdom that also are asymmetric in one way or another. So we see it in other fish species, we see it in crabs, we see it in birds, in snails, and even in other mammals. Um, even in humans, handedness is a type of behavioral asymmetry, which is um, pretty much uh, present in, in almost all human individuals. But what is unique about flatfishes is that the asymmetry encompasses their entire body organization. And this is really the only group of vertebrate animals that, um, that possesses this. And not only that, but they have to go through metamorphosis in order to get that way. Um, so this is um, a photograph of an individual larval starry flounder that I reared in British Columbia at four days old and 23 days old. And it, if you looked at this, you wouldn't guess it was a flatfish. It's symmetrical. It looks normal. It doesn't look like a Picasso painting. Um, and, but if you look at him, again, at 34 days old, you see something starting to happen. This is the close-up picture here of its head. Um, here's the, this is the left side of its head and the right side of its head. And its right eye, including all of the nerves, muscles, skeletal support for that eye, is physically moving slowly up across the top of the head. This takes a couple of weeks. This is a fish here at 45 days old and 58 days old where it's uh, metamorphosed into a proper bizarre flatfish, at which point it lies on the ocean floor, or in this case, in the bottom of my rearing buckets. Right? So this individual happens to have both eyes on the left side of its body. And maybe you can see that. Its abdomen is pointing down to the bottom. Um, and it started off, we were looking at the left side of its body. It now has both eyes on it. And um, in fact, almost all species of flatfishes um, have individuals that are all one way or all the other way. So this, I apologize. So this is a, this is a family tree of the order of flatfishes, and it's terribly busy. But the main reason I pointed it out for you is to show you that some group of flatfishes um, have individuals that are entirely left-sided, both eyes on the left, and other families and species have individuals that are entirely comprised of right-sided individuals. But then we have this rare uh, few, the seven of them to be exact, that have individuals that go both ways. They have lefties and righties within the same population. Um, so this is a extremely rare, seven species out of over 800. Um, and it's an example of, again, biodiversity within a single individual. And so one of these down here in this family, Pleuronectidae, we have right here in Juno. And this is the starry flounder. So if you've gone out jigging, you may have caught a starry flounder by accident, or you may have been introduced to one by um, seeing it in one of Ray Troll's prints. Take time to stop and smell the flounders. They make excellent fish tacos, but they aren't generally a, a, a target of a lot of active fishery activity. They're more sort of a, um, a recreational fishery species. Uh, but they have many interesting biological features about them, which is what drew my attention to study them. So this is a, a map showing the distribution of the species across the entire North Pacific in inshore waters on the continental shelf. And this shows you in the little pie diagrams and the bar graphs the relative frequency of the left-sided and right-sided individuals across that range. And we see a marked change in the frequency from 
um, equal numbers in Central California to about 70% left-sided here, um, to by the time you get to the coast of Russia, 100% left side up, and that persists all the way south till you get to central Japan. So, um, so this is called a cline. It's a geographical cline, and it's been the focus, one of the focuses of my research for some years now. Um, and one of the things that I've discovered is that left-sided and right-sided flounder, starry flounder, differ from each other in many ways. So this is, a, <laughs> this is a great simplification of a number of publications and a lot of data that I've accrued over the years to come to these conclusions, and I'd be happy to show you that data or talk about it later on. But these are basically what I've found. The left-sided and right-sided fish are different shapes consistently, pretty much wherever you look across the distribution of the species. They eat different things. They have different swimming abilities. They differ in their metabolic rates, for heaven's sake. And this is unexpected. This was all a surprise, and every time I find a new way that they differ, I'm continuously surprised um, and continuously baffled as to why they would be different. So this is an ongoing research project trying to understand the genetic mechanisms, um, the developmental mechanisms, and the ecological consequences of these differences. So, what about the others, right? There's this handful of species that have both uh, asymmetry types. And I wanted to know if the other species showed the same differences as starry flounder. And in particular, so this is starry flounder down here. This is called a, uh, a, a more derived or recently evolved family of fishes, but these Ancestral species also have individuals that have both lefties and righties within the species. And I've wanted to get my hands on them for years. So one of the most common species of these three is this guy. Get a load of him. This is Cetodes arumii. And for the rest of the talk, I'll just refer to it as Cetodes, a.k.a. the Indian halibut if you're in India, a.k.a. the Queensland halibut if you're in Australia, or the spiny turbot in other places. So I'm just gonna call it Cetodes. And this is a frontal view here, cheek to cheek, of starry flounder on the left, the left-sided and right-sided morph, and then the uh, Cetodes on the right. You can see a little snaggle tooth sticking out there. I think he lost a tooth during capture at some point. So you can see the, the position of the eyes off-center, the position of the mouth, um, and the differences in their pigmentation between left and right sides of their bodies. So, um, so Cetodes is not from around here. Um, they have a, a wide distribution in the Indo-West tropical, subtropical Pacific Oceans, all through Southeast Asia, up to the southern coast of Taiwan, um, all along the coast of India, and even to the eastern coast of Africa, the north parts of the northern coast of Queensland and Australia. So not the easiest fish to collect if you live in Australia, but boy, I've been wanting to collect them for about 12 years now. Um, there's also a modest fishery for them um, that started in the last several decades and is steadily increasing. Um, and now on average, it's about 25,000 tons of these guys are taken per year. And yet, in the literature, there is almost nothing known about their basic biology. What do they eat? Where do they spawn? Uh, how, do, do they differ in their body shape among locations? Do the left-sided and right-sided individuals differ in shape from each other? And I realize I might be the only person in the world that really would ask that question, but, um, but these, I mean, these are some other very fundamental biological questions that have remained unanswered despite this um, economic value that this species have, has. So I've been waiting and wanting to go to collect them for years, and I was lucky enough to meet Dr. Wei Jin Chen at a conference some years ago in Portland. Um, he came to see me give a talk on flatfish biology and introduced himself after my talk, and we started chatting, realized we had a lot of common interests. So Wei Jin is a geneticist, he studies the um, genetic basis of evolution of many different fish groups with also a fantastic eye for attention in 
more in terms of morphological details. Um, but he he invited me to come to Taiwan, and uh, he said he could he could host me there as a visiting scientist and help me to get samples of satotes. So when I was approaching and planning for my sabbatical, I got in touch with him and we applied for some funding through Taiwan's Ministry of Science and Technology, and off I went. So um, in early March of this year, 2018, I went to Taiwan um, and ended up over there for about two and a half months. So this is Taiwan here off the coast of China, about 115 miles across the, uh, the Taiwan Strait. The island's about 250 miles long, 90 miles wide. And um, there's some very interesting history there that I'm not going to get into tonight, but um, it was formerly known as Formosa. It was called Formosa some time ago. And now it's referred to as Taiwan or the Republic of China, whereas mainland China is referred to as the People's Republic of China. Um, but different people call it different things, and that's a whole other can of worms. So this is a very mountainous um, island and very populated island. There's a huge human population along the north uh, and western coast and into the south. Um, but in the center, there's mountains, lush jungle, and a relatively pristine uh, forest habitat. Um, it has the fourth highest mountain for an island in the world, which is just under 13,000 feet high. This is Yushan, or Jade Mountain. There's about 24 million people that live in Taiwan. And Taiwan's about the area of Denmark, um, or Maryland, so it's not very big. Um, and so it makes it the 17th most densely populated country in the world. And Taipei, here in the circled in red in the north, is the most populated city in Taiwan. So this was my home base, was in Taipei. It's the capital of Taiwan. It's the 40th most populated city in the world at just over 7 million, which with, in the most crowded places has a density of about 10,000 people per square millimeter, all living in high-rise apartments. Juno has 4.4. The main language is Mandarin Chinese, of which I speak about three words. So coming from Alaska, this was a culturally shocking experience, to say the least. But I was, um, I was warmly welcomed by Wei Zhen and his lab members here um, in front of the sign of the Institute of Oceanography at National Taiwan University, um, which is right in central Taipei. It's a very, very nice group of people, and they helped me to feel at home and get settled in um, and help me find my way around this gigantic, bustling city. Um, so they even gave me my own office. I had a temporary office that they reserved for visiting scientists up on the third floor, the oceanography building, looking over Half Moon Lake in the center of uh, campus. and. Um, my office came complete with a Formosan red-bellied tree squirrel who would visit me almost daily as he would make his rounds around the surface of the front wall of the building. So right away, we made a plan to sample fish uh, from four different locations, as widely dispersed as we, as we could in terms of our finances and the time that we had. Um, so we wanted to collect samples from southern Taiwan. Um, in Malaysia, here on the northern tip of Borneo, as well as two different locations in Thailand, one on either side of this peninsula to see if there's any differences between, between those two. Um, and so right away, I think I'd been um, in Taipei for about four days and we left for Malaysia. And um, this, these were group trips, so there would be, it was Wei Jen and I and a, a small number of other biologists who were on these trips to collect fish for their own projects. So it was really interesting and fun traveling with other biologists and um, checking out their projects and the fish that they would collect. Um, so we, we headed to Malaysia. We went to Kota Kanabalu, which is in the north tip here of Borneo, 
We stayed um, a few blocks from the fishing docks. This is a fishing port town, not a touristy town. And um, all the markets in the morning were sort of along the docks, and we would walk from our hotel through all these markets to get to the docks. A lot of bustling outdoor businesses, and we'd walk through all the veggie marts, these beautiful displays of vegetables and fruits and chilies. And eventually we'd get to the water. Um, and so we, there were a large number of very colorful, well-used uh, boats that would pull up in the, in the early morning. So these were all um, small, artisanal, basically family-level run fisheries and boats. Um, I didn't get a sense that there was a lot of management and um, people were just trying to get by. The boats weren't terribly large, so they didn't go very far offshore. They'd go offshore for a day or two max, bring back everything that they caught, and sell it on, um, on the docks in the morning. So they'd empty their catch out onto the docks in the early morning, and we would show up and start picking through them and finding the species that we wanted. So there were all kinds of things there that they were selling. Um, all the bycatch they would bring back with them and try to sell. So they wouldn't discard bycatch out at sea, they brought it all back. So here we have, you can't see this very well, but this is a, a juvenile hammerhead shark um, and some fish, a ray, and two sea anemones. And that was their catch for the day. And they had them for sale there. This bottom left shows uh, buckets of sea urchins that were collected, um, and some here on the bottom right, some snails, a few prawns, some fishes. It was a, a mishmash of different taxonomic diversity that were sold on these docks. These are some dried, um, dried rays, stingrays that we saw for sale, and some dried octopus for sale there as well. Uh, there are huge catches of different species of shrimp and prawns. This one is for you, Dr. Timoni. Um, lots of different species, large piles of them, all caught by bottom trawl there off the coastline of Borneo. Um, and then, of course, there were many species of fishes. There were large tuna, goat fishes, squirrel fishes, jacks, as well as many colorful crabs here in the bottom left, and, and also many, many different uh, species of cephalopods, squids, octopus, cuttlefish. It was impressive, and at the same time, in the back of my mind frequently, I was worried about the sustainability of all of it. So we would get to the markets and we would split up and go hunting for our fish species that we wanted to collect. This is Wei Jen, um, kneeling over somebody's catch, picking out fish. And I'd just like to say a word here quickly about my colleague Wei Jen. He was one of the most perpetually cheerful and seemingly inexhaustible people I've ever met in my life. Really difficult to keep up with this guy, and he was just cheerful no matter how little sleep he got. He's a prolific scientist with an impressive publication record, and he has an incredible eye for detail. So um, every time we would go to a market, he would point at a few individual fishes, and he'd say, I think it's a new species. And I'd look at it, and I'd say, well, I think it looks like all the other ones that you just collected. And he'd say, no. He'd say, look, there's a small fifth yellow stripe along the side of its head, or its lateral line has a little bit more steep of curve to it, or the position of its fin is a little bit more upright. And so he'd buy it and bag it and fly home to Taiwan and run the DNA. And sure enough, pretty much every time, he was right. So he, he discovers new species of fishes all the time. And uh, he, he discovers them faster than he can process them and describe them and write them up. So he has a backlog of species. But it, it, makes, it makes me wonder how many unidentified species really are out there that we have yet to discover. And many of them are being fished. Many of them maybe are being overfished and not regulated very well. And so it's possible that some of these species could be extirpated without ever even knowing that they were there. Um, so we would often see tables that looked like this. And so when I would go off on my own looking for flounder, I would look at tables like this. 
is obviously a mixed species table. And um, I would try to pick out the Satotes. So these, these are two tables that have a Satotes tucked in there. One of these things is not like the other. And so here we can see one here. Oh, look, he's got two eyes. All the others are normal with one eye. And then there's another one over here, but he's on his, his, his blind side is facing up, so it's white. So I would walk around and pick these out and buy all of them. Fortunately, they weren't very expensive. At the end of our uh, fishing trip, we would go back to the hotel, and we would um, set up a temporary biology lab in the hotel bathroom. Um, so this is what it looked like at different phases. Here you can see this is the TV back here, and these are our, our vials with ethanol and our scissors for our dissection, a little bit of Nescafe, um, <laughs> et cetera, our notebooks. And we would set up and we would get to work for hours in the hotel. So this is way Jen processing his fish. This is one of my satotes here that I'm about to photograph. And when we were done, we would pile all our fish in the bottom of the shower and sort them and count them, go buy big bads of ice, pack them up in the cooler, and, um, and either give them back to the vendors or pack them up to ship back to, to Taipei. So um, one of the things I was interested in with Satotes was whether there were differences in body shape among locations, and if there were differences in body shape between left-sided and right-sided individuals. So I photographed all of them and identified these using a software program called TPS Dig. I would identify these spots on the fish that were called landmarks. And then you enter these landmarks into the program and the, pro the program calculates as many different lines that connect all these pairs. Well, the math people in here can maybe guess what the equation for that is, yes? Um, and so here we had a, for uh, 16 landmarks, we had 120 different interlandmark distances. And the software then uses this data to generate a shape estimate for the fish. So this is an example. I haven't finished my data yet, but this is a, an example from a different publication that has done so. And you can get these grids, deformation grids, they call them, where you can describe multivariate axes of shape variation and see if there's any differences. Um, among locations or between fish. So stay tuned. This is what I'll be doing um, the, this winter. So this is a terrible photo um, outside the hotel window, but I show it to you. So this is still in Kota uh, Kanabalu. It shows the top of the mosque here that was right next door to our hotel room. And of course, it's blazing hot and very humid, and our hotel room smelled pretty bad. Um, so we had the windows wide open all the time, and, um, and so we would, um, we heard the call to prayer multiple times a day while we were processing our fish, and it was really, really quite beautiful, actually, and a, a very interesting backdrop to doing bathroom sink science projects in the <laughs> bathroom of a hotel. Um, so once I finished getting tissue samples from my flounder, I would, if I could, give them back to the vendors so that they could sell them again, because there was nothing wrong with them. They were still fresh, they were edible. All I did was take a piece of muscle out of it for a tissue sample and cut their stomachs out, and, but they were perfectly fine. So I would bring them back and give them back to the vendors, and they would look at me like, what, what is, what's wrong with you? Um, and the, several times, we were here for about four or five days, we would go back the next day and they would try to resell the same fish to us again, you know. <laughs> and we would no, we're not interested in them anymore, but I'm sure they thought we were absolutely insane. This Taiwanese guy, an American woman, cruising around buying 30 large flounder and then returning them 18 <laughs> hours later and then buying 30 more, you know, whatever. They were happy to sell them to us. So uh, we returned to Taiwan with our tissue samples and Wei Jen's fish, packed in our suitcases, made it through security. And uh, just a couple of weeks later, we planned our next trip uh, to Thailand. And we, um, we brought along Wei Jen's graduate student, Todd, who happened to grow up in Thailand, so it was great to have him along as a guide and interpreter. Wei Jen had colleagues at a university in Bangkok who hooked us up with this minivan, which we spent many hours in for the next week, and found a driver for us to drive us around to different fishing ports and, uh, and field, 
field station. So we would drive around with our fish packed in ice and coolers in the back going to the next uh, fishing town. So this is us. It was always hot. It was my sabbatical of being too hot pretty much all the time. <laughs> um, so this is me. This is Wei Jen. This is our driver. Um, and this was Todd. And we were out on the docks. And there were these beautiful um, variety of different fishing boats, different shapes and colors and, and sizes. So, um, so our trip to Thailand, Thailand was, was made up of pretty, uh, pretty full days. And um, I wouldn't necessarily recommend going to Renong or Shampong, the two places that we went for a vacation destination, not necessarily. These were working local fishing ports. Uh, so we would arrive at the fishing port um, at night and find a hotel, get a few hours of sleep. And we'd get up and go to the, um, to the docks by about 4 o'clock in the morning so we could be there when the, when the fish came in on, on the boats, you know. And, uh, and unlike in Malaysia, we had to be uh, escorted by a dock manager who would meet us there and then guide us through and help us um, interpret the purchasing of fishes from, from the vendors. So this is the scene we'd pull up at. And um, this is what it looked like. We would walk around looking for samples of species that we wanted to buy um, in scenes much like this one. This is a fairly neat and orderly example. Lots of times when we got there, right when they were unloading, it was a chaotic, slimy mess for a little while. We'd walk around, we'd split up, and we'd find our respective fishes. And I'd come across a pile like this. We have five satotis. I would say, yes, please bag them up, walk on, and usually wipe out the market of satotis every time I went, because I wanted to get as many as I could. Um, so then we'd pack up our fish and coolers, and we'd get back in the minivan, and we'd head to the local field station. So the universities in Bangkok have all these field stations stashed all over the country, which were, which were marvelous and highly variable in their amenities. Um, and there, so there were several that we worked at. This one was an actually like an outdoor open air facility. It had running water and some sinks, but it was great. We set up in the back, processed our fish, and uh, it was a, around this beautiful jungle uh, um, backdrop with birds and insects, and it was actually really, really quite lovely. This is another place, another field station that we went to. It was on the, on the western coast, on the Andaman Sea side. Um, the west side of the peninsula, and this is the facility. It was this large facility right on the beach, had all the amenities except air conditioning. And um, the whole place was up on these large concrete um, stilts. And this was, is, uh, it took some forethought in terms of the number of tsunamis that um, wash ashore. And in fact, this is one of the few buildings in the area that survived a huge tragic tsunami in 2000 for the Boxing Day tsunami. And walking around this facility, we were the only people there, and there would be these small shrines and dedications tucked into little places all over the facility um, in remembrance of the many people that died there during that tsunami. So we set up in one of the lab rooms. Um, it was great, it had everything we needed. It was blazing hot, very humid. Um, and this is me photographing the fish that we collected from the fish market that morning. Um, very tired, and, uh, but very happy to be there. You can see the two fans going in the background full speed ahead. Um, so these were really long days um, without many of the creature, uh, cre creature comforts, you know, including the espresso concoctions to which I have grown accustomed. And so, much to my surprise, I started consuming several of these uh, super coffee, three-in-one coffee mix per day <laughs> out of desperation, you know. Um, you can see this one's hastily torn open <laughs> before I photographed it. And the, so they have instant coffee crystals, powdered creamer, which I had sworn previously to never let enter um, my body, but so much for that. And lots of sugar. They're actually, they're actually pretty good. They're pretty good. <laughs> And so um, this was at the end of one of these epic days, and we were thrilled to take a break and go for a quick bite to eat in the nearby fishing town. These usually they were, these were pretty bare bones um, operations with open air kitchen, kitchens, but served just amazing food. 
food in Thailand was pretty much excellent everywhere we went. It's a little family kitchen. They served us three kinds of pad thai for about a buck fifty each. We were pretty excited about that. This is a different restaurant right on the docks. It had fresh seafood for sale out front, and then a kitchen in the back. Um, it was incredibly fresh food and very delicious, from what I could tell, above the blazing inferno of capsaicin that was going on <laughs> in my mouth. Um, but so these on the left here, on the top, those are marine catfish eggs. And they're large. They're about the size of a marble. And the soup below that is a catfish egg soup. Um, and then on the right, these are sea, uh, horseshoe crabs in the upper right that are common there on the beaches. And underneath that is a uh, horseshoe crab egg salad served in the empty shell of a horseshoe crab. And that one was a little bit challenging um, to eat. It was a unusual consistency. Um, I mean, so this whole trip to Taiwan and Malaysia and, and Thailand was a culinary adventure, and I could pretty much talk the whole hour about food. But, um, but I'm sure you're all wondering at this point, what does Satotis eat, <laughs> right? This was basically this is the reason why I was there, and one of the main reasons, I, uh, one of the main questions I wanted to find out. So of the several hundred fish that I ended up collecting in total, I removed all of their stomachs and would open up their stomachs and, and, and identify everything inside of the stomachs as best I could taxonomically. And so this is a little gory from time to time, but I managed to pull out a few pictures here to show you. So the, this was a, um, a slipper lobster and a large prawn. You can see that prawn's about five inches long. This is a packed full stomach in this fish. This was another stomach. Does anybody know what this is? Anybody recognize that? This, pardon? It well, it is a it is a cuddle. Well, it was a cuttlefish, and so you can see the little bits of ink left behind um, in the stomach of the fish. And then this thing is its is its cuddle bone, that is their their skeletal structure on the inside of their soft tissue, which at this point had been completely digested off. Uh, many of them had fishes in their stomachs in various stages of digestion. These were um, pony fishes we were able to identify. This one we couldn't identify. We had no idea what it is. We guessed that maybe it was a relative of the eel family, <laughs> but all that was left was this long spinal column. No head, no fins, nothing. So oftentimes we would just have to take our best guess and move on. Sometimes we found other flounder. So this is a little bit gross, but this is, uh, this is that peacock flounder that I showed you a picture of at the beginning. You could see it has its long fin rays intact there, and so apparently some flounder eat other flounder from time to time. And um, the most bizarre thing I found was this. So this chunk of meat down here is, this, is the stomach, and I found this thing inside the stomach, greatly distended the stomach. Couldn't imagine the fish could pass it. But the fish was large and well-muscled and seemed pretty healthy. And so this is a chopstick. It's a, most of a wooden chopstick. And I thought, well, that's as good a souvenir as any. And so I cleaned it off, and I <laughs> brought it back with me. Not going to pass it around, but if you want to look at it after the talk, I'll show it to you and keep it forever. So in our, in our road trips, we spent a lot of time driving from fish uh, port to processing station, and we often saw these trucks full of coconuts. And, um, and Todd pointed out that most of the trucks had macaques, pigtailed macaques, hanging along for the ride. So these guys were tied up. Um, they all seemed healthy, but they were, um, they were leashed to the truck and would just cruise along. And apparently, the, the farmers and the coconut plantations train them to climb up trees and knock off coconuts. And this is, they can do it much faster than humans can, and of course it's safer for us to send the monkey up, right? Um, but apparently this is, this is very widespread in Thailand, and Thailand is a huge exporter of coconuts. So if you if you use coconut milk or coconut oil, chances are some of it at some point has been collected by a pigtailed macaque. Um, we ended up back in Bangkok at the, um, at the Kasset Sart University, 
We finished processing our fish there before flying back to Taiwan. This is a sample of fish that um, Wei Jen collected, showing the biodiversity of the area, some unique species there, several of which he suspected were new species. And while we were um, finishing processing our flounder in the lab, we gave a few of them, they're very delicious, um, away to some graduate students in the building. And uh, uh, an hour later, they brought one back to us, all seasoned and barbecued, you know, as a gesture of thanks that we ate it immediately. It was, it was delicious. We devoured it while we were finishing processing up the other fishes. So um, we returned to Taiwan, where I remained for the rest of the time, processing fish, preparing fish samples for analysis, and exploring the country a little bit while I had a chance. So one of the chores that I did, one of the things I wanted to explore was the trophic ecology of these fishes. And one way to do that is to analyze the chemical composition of a piece of their muscle tissue. And you can use a spectrophotometer to measure different isotopes of nitrogen and carbon. And it tells you about where in the habitat they forage and about how high on the food web they're targeting, how predatory or omnivorous they are. Um, and so I was able to process these samples here in, or there in Taipei. So you take a muscle sample out of your fish, you put it in this, uh, freeze, this uh, freeze dryer, which a faculty member loaned to me for a couple days until it's dried into a hard, dried out chunk. And you grind it by hand with a mortar and pistol until it's nice, soft, powdery consistency. And then you here take, this is a little vial of powder, powdered muscle, you take one of these little tin caps put it in this holder, and you measure out tiny little amounts of powdered muscle until you get exactly, or as close to as possible, 0.75 milligrams of this stuff, which is not very much. Sometimes you'd overshoot, and you'd have to take a little bit out, and then you'd undershoot and have to add a little bit more. And then you finally, when you get your aliquot in the tin uh, capsule, you smash it flat, roll it up like a cigar, fold the sides in like a little hockey puck, and put it in one of these wells, in your 96 well plate. And you do that over and over and over for about 80 hours um, until you get all of your samples prepared and send it off to the mass spec to get analyzed. And I'm still in the process of analyzing that data. Um, so also stay tuned for that. So um, while we were in Taiwan, Wei Jen's parents, this is them, invited us to their home in the southern town of Tainan to have a family holiday dinner with them. It was a great honor. And so he, this is Wei Jen here on the left, his daughter, Yu An, and my sister who came to visit me for a short time. And we sat here and we had um, the, these crepes and we would put them, put in them different pieces of meat and fish and vegetables and fish eggs and sauces and roll it up and eat it. It was really pretty special and delicious. Um, and also during this trip to the south with my sister, we learned how to ride scooters, which were everywhere in Taiwan. And we were pretty proud of ourselves, as you can see from the picture. Um, it was a pretty hair-raising experience, actually. Um, but <laughs> we did it. Um, and so I did have a bit of time to wander around Taipei, and do some exploring and see the sites. And there were so many temples and beautiful koi ponds with koi fish in them. It's a dragon um, with a fountain of pond water coming out of its mouth and this little, um, this little uh, gondola sitting out in the middle of the pond. Koi ponds everywhere and many beautiful little green oases in the middle of this huge, densely populated city. It'd be sort of this uh, quiet green space. You could go sit and have a rest or eat some lunch. And then you could get outside of Taipei quite easily um, and go into the cooler, high elevation mountains surrounding the area, had these beautiful lush forests and full of biodiversity and, uh, and tea plantations. So oolong tea is a big export of, tai of Taiwan. Um, and this was a tea house that we went to visit. This is a couple that had their own tea plantation and they had a tea house and they would serve samples for you to try different kinds and then of course sell the teas and we bought quite a bit and it was really really delicious oolong tea. Um, I got to go visit the national, this is a view from the National Chiang Kai-shek Memorial Hall. Um, and this is a big square here called Liberty Square. And this was built in honor of a now 
a deceased political leader who had mixed reviews um, of the same name. It was a pretty phenomenal architectural area in this Liberty Square. And there were mu many beautiful temples that you could visit. Um, this, is a, this is a Taoist temple, very elaborate. Um, but there were temples also to Confucius. There were Buddhist temples scattered all around Taipei and all around the country of Taiwan. There were always uh, serene, beautiful places to visit. This is an incense cauldron out in front of one of these temples guarded by two dragons, one on each side. And you can see the glowing sticks of incense that were lit, burning in the middle. But so while I was there, I was able to summarize some early results. And here I've plotted out the proportion of left and right sided satotes, plotted out at the four locations I sampled them from. And what's, so what's interesting here is there's basically similar frequencies um, everywhere in the f among the four locations. There's some small variations, you know, but this certainly is not statistically significantly different. It seems like there are equal proportions of, of them everywhere. And this is about the same geographical distance as the coast of North America, where in Starry Flounder, we see very big differences in the proportion of the two, uh, the two asymmetry types. So there, there could be multiple reasons for that difference between the two species, and I'm investigating several different hypotheses that will, that will test those. So I'll be um, looking forward to getting some of those results published in the next year. So on my last day, the lab threw me a going away luncheon, complete with Pepsi and Coca-Cola and Domino's Pizza and KFC. I was a little perplexed by this, but... <laughs> I think it was just in honor of my Americanism, you know. <laughs> and, um, but I, I really could not have wished for a better group of colleagues to work with. They were excellent scientists, literally to the individual, um, but at the same time, in incredibly gender generous and kind. Um, they were encouraging of all my efforts, eternally patient with me, um, with my bad Mandarin, and showing where supplies were and helping me order food at restaurants. Um, so I just, I feel so fortunate to have had the privilege of working with them and will be forever grateful for the experience. Um, and then I'd just like to end up here with a quote by one of my favorite biologists, Ed Wilson. He's 89, he's 89 now and um, quite famous. He was a professor at Harvard for most of his career. He's an entomologist. Um, and this is one of my favorite quotes of his. When you have seen one ant, one bird, one tree, one flatfish, I added that. You, you have not seen them all. And so with that, I'd like to thank the University of Alaska Southeast for giving me the opportunity to take a research sabbatical leave. Uh, the National University of Taiwan, their Institute of Oceanography, and Dr. Wei Chen, Chen and his lab members for hosting me and the Taiwan Ministry of Science and Technology travel grant, which helped pay for some of the expenses. So, and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Any questions? Yep, happy to take any questions you may have. We could always talk about food, too, if you want to. I'm just filling space while they pick up questions, the audience. But I wondered about, I want to ask a fishing question. I don't know if you know mm -hmm. the answer. But I first wanted to say, did you know that Juno has a sister city in Taiwan? I did not know that. Which city is it? Does anybody know what it is? Jai, which is on the on the west side, right? But it's where you take take that train up to oh, Alishan, okay. the high mountain. But uh, yes, and they, vi they have visited here at UAS in huh. the 1990s. But my question thing? has to do with the artisanal fishing. So, you know, there's overfishing in the world, um, but it's really not necessarily the result of artisanal fishers. Right. But this strategy of, of taking all the bycatch, what what do you make of that strategy in terms of conserving or not doing damage to biodiversity as opposed to the intensive fishing on right. one species? Right, yeah, that's a great question. I think, and I think there's, there are pros and cons 
And the, the pro is certainly, um, it's beneficial for the, for the fishers and um, good for the economy and the, and the ability to get access to food security in these villages. And many of these people are um, um, quite, quite strapped for money, right, and just trying to get by. And so by catching, bringing back everything, they, and they usually sold pretty much everything, um, this is um, less wasteful. It's more efficient, certainly, for human consumption of the seafood. Um, however, I don't think much of it was recorded. And so many of these species, the young sharks, we saw a lot of young sharks that were pre-reproductive that were sold, and they were probably not recorded anywhere. And so it's not, we're not able to keep track of the numbers that are brought in as bycatch. And so that, that's the cost, at least with the, with the large industrial fishing, that's much more um, strictly managed, and you have to account for the biomass of your of your uh, bycatch, and that goes into the total quotas, more or less, that are allowed for that bycatch species. But I don't think that was happening here. So it's you know it's more efficient. It doesn't just get shoveled overboard, but it um, but it maybe doesn't get recorded. It should. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I was wondering, uh, with regards to flatfish, halibut, for example, you know how their eyes, uh, they move uh, so that they were laying on the bottom, their bottom fish? Yes. So can you talk a little bit about the um, evolutionary you know, significance of that, the adaptation? Why do they do that? I mean, what, uh, what benefit does that give them in, you know, in instead of having binocular vision? Thank right, you. right. Yes, and that's um, that's a that's a great question, and it's it's related to so flatfishes have this ability to raise and lower their eyeballs, and they can move them around independently of each other. Here, let's look at this guy here. So you can see they have these large bulbous eyeballs sticking up, and they can move them around. And this is, um, we believe, partly. Um, an adaptation for their benthic habitat. So, and I didn't mention this, but most flatfishes live on, in, on, in contact with the ocean floor and they bury themselves with the sediment. So they'll shimmy their bodies and they'll kick sand up so it covers up their bodies and it helps them to remain cryptic. Um, but in order to continue to be able to see, they have to have somewhat telescopic eyeballs. And so they have these special uh, fluid-filled sacs that are unique to the family of flat, the order of flatfishes that helps them to, they can inflate them and deflate them to raise and lower their eyeballs as needed. So we don't see it in other groups of fishes, but we think it's an adaptation to being covered up in sand. Halibut too. I mean, they do. And that, I mean, as juveniles, as youngsters, halibut bury themselves more often. As big adults, they don't really have to, you know, or like, pff, whatever. But they, um, but as ju as juveniles, I mean, I don't think they actually think, but they, um, they, as juveniles, it's certainly beneficial to hide from predators by burying, and so they would have that capacity as juveniles and would just retain it to some degree as adults, would be my guess. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Uh, um, can you talk about the, you talked about the Satotes as sort of, I think, an ancestral or an older. Yeah. Does that mean that the starry flounders here are sort of, I'm not going to have the right words, but sort of like evolutionary descendants of that fish? Correct. So does that mean that they slowly kind of lump their way across the Pacific Ocean to get to here? Uh, the second answer, no. Okay. No, the first answer, correct. So, so the... Um, the Satotes, and good recall on that, by the way, are way up here at the top, at the base of the tree. They're called a basal group. So we, f we know through genetics and morphology that all the rest of the flounders share a common ancestor with Satotes. And the Satotes probably look most similar to the first flatfish that evolved. 
um, but their, dis their dispersal throughout the rest of the world is very complicated. And um, starry flounder come from a family that is very common in the Atlantic um, and in the Indian Oceans, dispersed all over. So there doesn't seem to be a, a, a great degree of taxonomic clumping within the flatfishes. They seem to have widely dispersed and then, and then diversified into their different habitats independently of each other. The yeah, starry flounder are relatively young species. They estimate maybe 200,000 years old, which is young, believe it or not. I've done uh, quite a bit of underwater filming here in the Juneau area, where I'd put a, a GoPro out in the marine environment and uh, then watch it between the tides and what comes around it and everything. And I notice that uh, the starry flounders uh, seem to be extremely curious. And they would come up and uh, move their eyes back and forth right in front of the camera and oh look yeah. at it. And nice. Uh, uh, but it seemed to be the most curious of the uh, fishes that were uh, in the area. And hmm. I didn't know whether a much had been done about behavior or do they? Yeah, uh, well, I've, I've had them in captivity many times. I've raised them in captivity and um, had juveniles in captivity for various behavioral experiments. And fortunately, among the flatfish species, they're one of the easiest to keep in captivity. Mm -hmm. They seem to adapt. They are fairly bold. And so maybe this is associated with curiosity in the natural habitat. They don't seem to be very skittish. Um, as opposed to, so halibut, trying to keep halibut in captivity is difficult. They get stressed very easily, they'll stop eating, they'll injure themselves, um, hitting up against the sides of the tank. Starry mm -hmm. flounder, just like, they just sort of hang out. So that's an indication of, of um, uh, adaptability to stressful situations, and it's probably correlated with curiosity and boldness in <laughs> natural habitats, too. But yeah, mm -hmm. that's interesting. I'd love to see some of your footage. It's, well. <laughs> Were they left-sided or right-sided? You know? <laughs> yeah, I'd love to share it, but I, I've got one really weird question, and uh, it's when I've been watching uh, uh, ravens digging sand lance out of the out of the, the, yep. the beaches yep. and that's here locally mm -hmm. and then they would uh, dig uh, staggoin sculpins mm -hmm. and sometimes they'd be quite a ways from the water where they dig them out of the uh, yes out of the beach the staghorns uh -huh. yep. and they would uh, uh, the staghorns very much alive and very oh, large yes. mm -hmm. And I assume they can tolerate atmospheric oxygen. Or, or they can, yeah. Uh, but what I was curious about is the ravens would also find a clump of eggs yes. on the staghorn sculpin. Mm -hmm. And it looked like the eggs were covered with a uh, horse clam, uh, the shell, the oh. half a shell. Huh. And it, it, it was so bizarre. I, I, I've uh, uh, videoed this three different times in three different places. And multiple fishes get dug up and they have a clam shell covering their egg mass. Yeah, and oh. I didn't know whether the female laid eggs and, and put a shell on the male and the male had to guard them or just what was yeah. going on. But uh, So they do, uh, they do bury themselves, staghorn sculpin will bury themselves when they're, when they're spawning eggs. And they also have really high tolerance to being out of the water so they can undergo gas exchange through their skin. So you'll often find them most abundantly in these high intertidal areas where most other fish can't, can't survive. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I just don't know, I hadn't heard about that, but it, they wouldn't be the first fish that used a, used a substrate or a tool to deposit their egg mass in. Um, I haven't I haven't heard of this, but if you've seen it multiple times, there's probably some something going on. Maybe they dig around and find find a clam shell that'll be a nice little protective cup, and then mm -hmm. lay their eggs in it. Yeah, totally. Yeah, if it feasible. hadn't been for the raven, I'd have no idea. 
Right, the Ravens knew, I guess. <laughs> Thank you. No, it's Hi. Hi. I'm wondering uh, where your favorite places are to collect sari flounder around here, and how do you do it? Did you already, did you, we miss that in the first? No, I didn't, I didn't talk about okay, that. Okay, will you tell us? My favorite places? Yeah, like what are the most productive places to collect some of them, and then how that do you actually, I like, see. do you fishy, fishy, how do you get them? Right, so one of the most productive places is out at um, Eagle Beach, or, well, I should, I should say, um, the, the, where the confluence of Eagle River and, um, thank you, Herbert River, drain that huge sand flat. Pretty much every time we go there, the, we, we catch a ton of them. The few times we've gone to Berners Bay, that huge beach that greets you as you approach Berners Bay, we've caught many, many in very short periods of time. Um, so those are the most productive places to go. Um, and we catch them with beach seines. So we go out and we have a long net and it's attached to one person's foot on one side and another person's foot on the other side and you just sort of drag it through the water and it scoops the fish up gently from the sand. And then you have to sort of gently keep it on the floor of the ocean, you know, and pull it up to the beach by hand. So we do, they go out five minutes and catch a bunch of them, sometimes. With, with satotes and with starry flounder, what determines which, whether they become right-sided or left-sided? Question of the century. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so with satotes, I don't know. With starry flounder, it, there appears to be a moderate heritable basis to direction. And this is um, known through breeding experiments that were done in the 80s by David Polakansky um, who actually has Alaskan connections, or he did back in the 80s. And then I did some breeding experiments to try to replicate what he found, and I did, and found that I didn't, I didn't have this data on a slide with me tonight, but when you breed left-sided with left-sided, you get about 85% left-sided offspring, and right-side with right-side, you get about the same right-sided, and if you mix them, you get about half. Um, and so that certainly implies that it's not completely 100% um, heritable, but there could be an environmental factor. There could be multiple genes involved, um, but there certainly seems to be a moderate heritable basis, at least in starry flounder, but it hasn't been tested for in any other species of flatfish that has both, has both morphs. Thank so you. I'd love to find out. Hi. Hi. Um, Wondering about the reproductive, was there any clue about the, the reproductive, or well, you probably know about the starry flounder, but the reproductive when you were in Taipei, did you any no idea. clue at any similarities that no. you saw in the starry and flounder? And everybody here? that I asked, I would ask the fishermen when I could, and nobody seems to know anything about where they go to spawn or whether the young float to the surface or stay attached to the ocean floor. Uh, I don't know. Thanks, Carolyn. Great talk. Thank you. So out of the 800 species of flatfish, how many species does Alaska have? How many species does Alaska have? Probably 30-ish in that ballpark, depending on where you are. It's a big state. But it might be a little bit more than that. I don't know exactly, but I would guess around 30. Is that pretty diverse for as far as flatfishes geographically go? Or is that, are we a pretty hot spot for flatfishes? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> there, <laughs> there's a greater diversity of them in more southern latitudes, like so many things. Um, but so in the, at the same latitude in the Atlantic, there's a great number of species of them in the north. There's also a great number of species them, of them in the similar latitudes in the south. So I would say it's a it's on par, but it certainly isn't a it isn't a hot spot for species numbers. The hot spots is in, in places like the Indo West Pacific Ocean where we were, and a lot of those species are small. You know, never really get much larger than uh, a few inches or a foot long.
Any other questions? Okay. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.